Now I'll present a lot of data and I'll then summarize in the end what all these interventions, uh, re the changes or advances really mean. Uh, what happened here? Let's start with the first one. So it means, can I play with this or no? No, this, this is too advanced and this is too point. Point. Ah, that's, okay, good. Good to learn. Let's see now. Go back. Okay. So this, I always start my first slide uh, for the intervention because of Andreas Grunswick, who did uh, his first angioplasty. We call him father of angioplasty. His dream was the catheter-based Percutaneous treatment of vascular disease and alert and awake patient. And of course, ultimate safety, that is, uh, I put it in my quotation, and that is where we are now. And the cases, examples uh, which Dr. Keeney showed, uh, that is what happening now that uh, all the transcatheter cases, they are discharged in 24 hours, just like PCI. So many of the cases now, almost 30, 35% are discharged next day, getting a tower today and going home next day. So purpose of uh, what I'm going to sh uh, share with you is top 10 trials of coronary intervention of 2019. We still have AHA next month. So particularly the ischemia trial will be very big, but we'll wait for it and that will become part of my uh, June uh, top 10 advances of coronary intervention. So now, until now, what has been presented uh, with the AS this year's ACC, European Society of Cardiology, and, um, and recently Transcatheter Therapeutic, because these trials, which I have included, make sense because we are going to change our practice. So first one is atherectomy studies for calcified lesion. So calcified lesion, basically you can see, it's uh, on angiogram, uh, very, uh, the tram track, you can see the ghost of the vessel. Okay, and there is no pointer. We can show it here. Forget that, yeah. So basically, the, you can see the calcium by angiogram and then by various testings um, by IVAS as well as OCT. The, this is the problem because calcium gives trouble for interventionist. Your stent doesn't go, does not expand, and have a lot of uh, complications. So there are a lot of devices which have come, particularly atherectomy, rotational and orbital atherectomies. Uh, they have different mechanism of action and uh, takes care of this calcium, basically. And subsequent stenting has shown to be beneficial or good stent opposition. Now, it's used only in about 5-7% of cases. It's still a small number. Calcific lesion, particularly severe, is about 10%. Half of them uh, getting the atherectomy in the United States at present. We actually did the trial, MACE trial, to see what is our pattern of how do we take care of the calcific lesions? These are the none on mild, middle being moderate and severe on the, uh, on the, the violet color, showing that only one third of the severe calcified uh, patients getting atherectomy at present. Majority are just getting without atherectomy. So what were the results? Basically, we found that patients who have severe calcium is the problem, not mild or mod moderate, which is the white or the red. So it is the severe calcium because associated with higher lesion, uh, um, lower lesion success and higher subsequent MACE in terms of MI and TVR. So basically we are still trying to work how to take care of the severely calcific lesions and uh, there are many studies which have been uh, presented, one of them being the Euro 4C registry using the rotational atherectomy of multiple centers showing that yes, complications do occur in these cases, but overall, remains in this calcific lesions less than 5% and good MACE rate. But many of these patients do have death non-cardiac and largely because of their high comorbid conditions. So we actually have give, published our algorithm that how to take care of this calcific lesion and the recently uh, did about one and a half years of hard work to get top 
interventionists who use rotation atherectomy and come up with the North American expert review of rotational atherectomy in circulation and really uh, emphasize various technical aspects, who should do it, should not do it, caution, complications, how to manage, very extensive this, uh, our publication in this field. There is another publication came out of uh, in the Jack about the calcific coronary artery, um, state of the art review. One of the new device which is coming is the shock wave called lithoplasty or lithotripsy. Basically, just like you do a renal stones breakage, we are trying to break that calcium uh, by a balloon and pu putting those ultrasonic energy and crack the calcium, and we'll be hearing more and more about this device. There is only one trial at present ongoing to answer uh, the question whether atherectomy improves outcome on long term. That is the Eclipse trial of 1,800 to 2,000 patients, orbital atherectomy versus conventional balloon angioplasty followed by stenting and see whether there is an improvement in overall outcome and decreased MACE at, uh, at uh, one year. Second, National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. As you know, the shock is always a trouble. Uh, we know that uh, very high mortality, about 70 plus percent, various trials have shown and failed of uh, balloon pump, medical therapy, multiple, you have higher vasopressors, you have higher uh, mortality of these cases. So therefore, actually the Dr. Bill O'Neill from Detroit took this initiative of the cardiogenic shock. So what they did basically is, came up with a clear-cut plan that how these patients should be managed uh, with the well-defined protocol. And after the initial success, showing the survival in about 60, uh, the about 70 plus percent of cases, the started the national shock initiative uh, program, which went to various uh, you know states, including uh, New York also, 76 percent uh, shock initiative have started. And that has actually led to what used to be in their own 72% survival became 88% survival. They have clear guidelines how these patients should be managed. Initially, rapid transfer, right heart catheterization, use of Impala CP device, and of course, very close monitoring. And when patients start going down, you escalate uh, to LVAD and ECMO. So this, by all those, uh, has really led to, the, now we can say, until now, we used to have 50% survival. That improve, actually has improved to now 77% uh, with this uh, National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative, So, which has led to making the shock care centers. So just like a, a, you have a, the stroke centers and MI centers, the shock centers, and there is a clear-cut pathway that how these centers should work, work with the EMS, with the uh, ED, and uh, going to the cardiac catheterization lab and uh, rapid uh, escalation, not wait and watch. See what's going to happen to the patient. So once patients start deteriorating, that you're rapidly uh, with going to the algorithms and they have seven points very nicely written. I won't bore you with that, but this is part of our QA initiative because we are starting at Sinai uh, with the advanced mechanical circulatory support. So besides just doing the PCI, you need to give some additional support to the myocardium. Artery may be open, but because myocardium is damaged and stunned, you need to go to a next level of care besides just doing impala. And uh, as I mentioned, so very nicely now we call it a shock team and shock doc. So specialty, new specialty has originated with this. And I expect uh, Mount Sinai being part with our, such a big network, uh, which we have started. We have the uh, Mount Sinai MS shock, uh, the telephone call and patients are being transferred and we are evaluating where are the system gaps and how to follow what has been uh, basically uh, suggested in the literature. So we are following those and hopefully in next uh, one year we'll have our own data that what is our mortality of the cardiogenic shock patients. So really a uh, very important initiative now. Define PCI and imaging trials of uh, PCI, there are two of them, which uh, one was the defined PCI, that means uh, that you have done a good PCI. We know that FFR and IFR are the physiological testings. What we, if IFR, which is the resting indices, if it less than 0.89 means there is significant lesion. If you have FFR, we give adenosine, less than 0.8 means significant lesion. If there are more than 0.8 on FFR, more than 0.89 or in IFR, that means it's not a significant lesion and those patients are treated medically. 
so understandable but now you have done the pci what if your ffr or ifr still remain low and we know that many of these patients after good pci continues to have angina we always say microvascular angina stent stretch and so but truly they have angina and of course we know the mace rate occurs as shown in various uh, studies so also studies have shown that you have done the pci you are done now you if you measure the ffr and ifr in those if you see some percent of cases is still less than 0.8 that means you should be doing pci now while you are already completed so same uh, the data on various uh, that if you, once you optimize you may get better and of course once you have a lower if ffr and so is associated with higher event rate at follow up so we, we want to get so this is pci done ffr less than 0.8 of course there is a high event rate so idea is the maybe on angiography it looks good maybe we have not relieve complete ischemia so this was the uh, trial called define pci idea was let's see what percent of patients where we had done the good angiographic pci that ff ifr is less than 0.89 that means significant as if you have not done the pci so this was very interesting uh, study and idea was to just uh, go through uh, blinded no don't change the therapy yet. just let's understand what the problem is so therefore 0.89 do the ifr and you can see some percent of cases ifr remain less than 0.89 even after successful pci so majority of them went up but about 24% of patients you looking good uh, otherwise but you know mild diffuse disease you combine it will create a decrease uh, flow in the distal vessel so the, therefore positive ifr and uh, shown that 24% of these patients will have after successful pci by the expert operated in the multi center study having a ifr of less than 0.89 so we are leaving 24% patient ischemic no wonder why many time patient have chest pain and positive stress test even after good successful pci now many of those are with a focal lesion majority of them there is a little focal lesion at the end at the stent with the edge or distally and of course some cases have diffuse disease so we know the diffuse disease is a trouble you can take care of it but at least focal maybe optimize the put a another stent so diffuse you don't want to do, do do the full metal jacket of the vessel but you can do so this is what is proposed in the uh, basically that what we should be doing in this uh, randomized trial which is just taking off define guided physiological stenting so not only that what you have done pre one is the ifr, IFR guided you pull back and then you do pci based on it you additional stent needed to make ifr more than 0.9 and compare to your standard care and you'll hear more about it in couple of years to see whether ifr guided improves overall outcome there is another trial which we that oct you look at the lesion by the ifs or oct which is a little more sophisticated versus you do ffr guided pci this was the forja trial uh, and basically ffr assessment and oct assessment of the patients who underwent pci and uh, you can see sometimes cordons as well as discordants uh, of uh, lesions look good uh, but and of course uh, we have clear cut criteria that what should be have a pci based on the oct that area stenosis of more than 75% mla of less than 2.5 um, mm square and so and basically found that once you do oct versus ffr guided pci there was no difference in mace a small study and no difference in angina status both were about the same 6.8 to 8 but what happened is ffr guided pci has a short length of stay and less expensive why you put less stent oct you put more stent more additional devices to optimize so clearly the ffr now this is one month study they are following these patients for a uh, year one year and so we'll know more mace point of view but it seems to be short term mace equal but resource utilization are less actually die use also was less then the issue was the patients who are high risk for coronary artery disease they have finished their acute event mi is done pci is done what happened one or two years later should we give them aspirin or aspirin clopidogrel as you are aware of that karishma trial done didn't make any difference diabetic is a classical subgroup of our cad patients what if you had ticagrelor because there was a trial called pegasus which showed that patients who have stent more than one year 
those who have prior MI, if you give continue uh, the ticagrelor law after 12 months to 30 months, you have better outcome. So question was, what if you do it in a diabetic patient, use the ticagrelor, ty and of course, many of these patients will have prior PCI. So that was the trial, Themis and Themis PCI. So this was presented, uh, background basically, as I mentioned, uh, and a large number of patients, 20,000 patients, and basically showed that in these diabetic patients, 20,000, that by giving the ticagrelor, which was 90, and then decreased to 60 milligram twice a day, so any patient who is stable CAD for whatever reason you want to give after one year should not be 90 milligram twice a day. Ticagrelor dose should be 60 milligram twice a day because that is associated with a lower bleeding without compromising efficacy. So basically what they found at three year follow up, then there was about 0.7% lowering of death MI and stroke in these diabetic patients compared to placebo, which is okay. The, this was the individual endpoints, which you can see here, but the problem is here. By giving ticagrelor to these patients, the, compared to aspirin alone, you have a higher major bleeding, more than 1%. And remember, ischemic, the ischemic endpoint was only 0.7% decrease. And now you have a higher bleeding, 1%, and including the, your major bleeding as well as intracranial hemorrhage, about 0.2%. So therefore, if you think about the net benefit, safety versus uh, the efficacy, it looks like the, it's not safe. So editorial basically was that in diabetic patient with no stroke, no prior PCI or MI, giving routinely ticagrelor is not beneficial because of bleeding. And of course, there was a lot of discontinuation of the drug. So what about the patients? So therefore, that was the conclusion. But what about the patients who have a PCI? So that was the sub-study of the Themis, which is Themis PCI. So what about the patients who have PCI in the past? As you can see here, of those 20,000 patients in Ticagrel or placebo group, about 60% had the PCI in both. So what is this group who had a PCI before? Was there a benefit of Ticagrel or in these patients? And answer to that is yes. So answer was that patients on the left side, as you can see, uh, the benefit about 1.2% lower uh, death MI and stroke in the patients who have prior PCI, but no dif difference who did have the, in the patients who did not have PCI. So at least we will learn one. But then second is, what about the bleeding? That was the concern in the original trial. And you can see here, yes, bleeding still was slightly higher, but it now was no longer, these are the individual endpoints, but uh, basically not the fatal bleeding. So major bleeding was about 0.9 higher, but the intracranial hemorrhage and fatal bleeding was not higher in the PCI subgroup. So basically they concluded uh, the net clinical benefit is still favors in a patients who have diabetes, prior PCI, that you continue uh, ticagrelor for three years at a 60 milligram twice a day along with baby aspirin. And this was basically the uh, overall the events that benefited in this side, not on the prior PCI side. Whether it will change the practice or so, I'm not sure, but a very positive uh, the conclusion of the trial was the ticagrelor in diabetic patient does work and uh, may, may be used as a second line uh, prevention of these uh, events. So this adds to many other studies which have been done in the ticagrelor in this field. Now what also we learned, that anytime you have any agent, these antiplatelet agents cause bleeding. You need the antidote, and luckily, now we already have an antidote of ticagrelor, uh, which will have been done in the healthy uh, people, and basically, that once you give ticagrelor, your inhibition aggregation is uh, quite high. I mean, 20% goes down to 20%, but if you give this agent, rapidly reverses the ticagrelor effect. So very, very uh, interesting. A small study, but published in NEJM, and hopefully we'll have soon the reversal agent for ticagrelor also. Then Augusto trial of NOAC versus warfarin plus minus aspirin. As you know, there are a few trials have been done in the past, WUST, Pioneer, and Reduel. All those have evaluated combination of dual antiplatelet therapy or single antiplatelet therapy with the NOAC and so. And overall, I would say the answer basically was with the Pioneer AFib that you take a 15 milligram of rivaroxaban plus 
clopidogrel 75 milligram had the best risk profile in terms of efficacy and lower bleeding. But we needed to go a little further. So what happens? What about the aspirin? Do you really need it in a randomized fashion? And this was the trial, very nice trial, or you can see here, of 4,600 patients. Answer was giving apixaban versus vitamin K patients who need the, the anticoagulants, and then this, whether they should get aspirin or no aspirin. So it was two by two factorial design, and of course it's a five milligram BID, but look at this, many patients, old age, Less than 60 kilo, high creatinine, got 2.5 BID. And that is where, uh, and then of course, all these patients receive clopidogrel uh, as the background in the 93% of these cases. So very important question. Should, is the, the warfarin better than, or epixaban better than warfarin? And secondly, what happens when you add or subtract aspirin with this? So this was the individual design, and you saw basically here now, that vitamin K antagonist in terms of uh, major bleeding and or clinically relevant non-major bleeding was significantly lower with apixaban compared to warfarin. So another study showing warfarin bye-bye. The apixaban was better. And uh, the, these are clearly now, what about the aspirin? In those group entire, aspirin has a higher bleeding, again compared to placebo. You say, well, not surprised, but... Uh, Clearly, we learned again now that aspirin was the culprit. And then if you take all those four scenarios, and look at this just one second to point that out, that if you have vitamin K, warfarin aspirin, very bad. Worst, apixaban aspirin second, then vitamin K plus placebo, and then lastly is apixaban and placebo has the best outcome in terms of bleeding, lowest bleeding, 7.3. So what should be our standard of treatment? Should be apixaban, alone, along with single antiplatelet therapy of clopidogrel patients who need uh, these therapies after uh, whether intervention or management of acute coronary syndrome. And these are the individual uh, endpoints which are shown here. Uh, and uh, now if you take ACS medical patient, ACS PCI patient, elective PCI patient, the story remains the same, that apixaban is superior to vitamin K antagonist. And of course, if you add aspirin uh, and take a force different subgroup, it remains aspirin plus uh, apixaban plus placebo has the lowest bleeding and of course uh, the lowest uh, the death and hospitalization. So that becomes the standard of treatment now as of the latest trial. Now safari STEMI, a trial of radial versus femoral axis, what is it? So you know that over the years many trials have been done to see whether uh, radial access is better or femoral access is better. Latest being, last year I presented one of our top advances, matrix trial of the one year follow-up, comparing radial access in STEMI patients versus transfemoral, and basically showed that one year net adverse co coronary events were lower with the radial compared to femoral. So clearly, this, this added to many other trials in the past, with the overall uh, individual endpoints lower and lower bleeding became the guideline. We don't have guideline updated in the United States, but it's a class one indication as the European guideline of last year. We say, well, everything looks like yes. Answer is radial is the answer. Well, we always know in our field, nothing is long lasting. So much so, we get a trial. Safari STEMI, trial done from Canada in STEMI patients. Now these are basically, it, Probably what the criticism always was this radial fanatics, you know, those who consider themselves as a radial center. Maybe there you do the trial, the radial was better. What if you take in the entire country and see what happens? And this is what done in Canada. So lot good centers. So trial of the, uh, again, large number of patients uh, with the uh, comparing radial access versus femoral access. And of course you give heparin and uh, the P2Y12 at your discretion. Uh, avoid patients who have fibrinolytic therapy. As you can see here, uh, the clopidogrel was given in 18%, ticagrelor in 90 plus percent of cases. It's all PCI done with bivalurin. And uh, what did it, the radial caused delay in your PCI. You see that onset of balloon time, arrival to PCI center, and clearly it caused more fluoroscopy time, 
and so and so forth. So basically what it did, that even in the good centers, radial caused a little more delay compared to femoral. But what does it mean? Did it cause any problem in overall outcome? Well, it basically first time now, the large trial of 2,400 patients showing that there's no difference in 30-day mortality. Now it wipes out the entire, our seven, eight years of publications. All kept on saying radial is better, radial is better, radial is better than femoral. And show us so that everybody had to learn radial. You know, sometimes we say that you can teach the old dog the new tricks, but we all had to learn. We started learning radial. Now, all of a sudden, one trial says that no. And these are the individual endpoints of reinfarction, stroke, and more important, until now, uh, and of course, stent thrombosis was not different. More important, biggest advantage of the radial was lower bleeding and vascular complication. And look at it here. In these patients, no difference. So that basically means you're a good operator, you're good access, femoral, closure, clearly as good as the radial, so you don't have to feel bad about it. And this adds to numerous trials, which I mentioned, and the saying that Safari STEMI is the largest study after matrix and the largest dedicated primary PCI study and showed basically no benefit of radial intervention. So that whatever you need to do, that's okay. Don't have to feel bad about that if you don't want to do a radial intervention in acute MI, although the whole country is right now the going on the radial bandwagon, we may need one or two more trials to really, uh, uh, I would say, balance out this field. Then, what about the long-term uh, follow-up of the patients with the PCI in cabbage? Remember, you have heard about one-year follow-up, three-year follow-up, five-year follow-up of the PCI versus cabbage. Usually, they are done for left main or multi-vessel CAD. What we know so far, the cabbage, lower repeat revascularization, durable, durable angina relief, lower mortality in high syntax score or multi-vessel diabetic, like freedom and syntax trial, better quality of life parameters. Uh, the PCI, rapid recovery, lower length of stay, better short-term results, lower CVA, improvement in EF, and similar outcome in left main uh, and low syntax score patients. So these are the data we have up to five years. Now what happens between five to 10 years? Even if some studies, which is the cabbage showed the benefit, we are hoping that maybe after five years, the graft will start closing. So PCI stent, if doesn't give trouble after one year, will be good. So that is what the hope was. I can tell you in 2019, Let's see our hope was maintained or was shattered. We have the trials of the various follow-up, as you can see here, five of them presented five year plus data of this. One was the Lehman's trial, very small trial. It did show they, they were beneficial even at one year, five year, 10 year, that better ejection fraction. But this was a trial done in Brazil, not a good results because seven, only uh, Lima was used in 72% of cases, but at least one positive trial. Second, Freedom Follow-On study, which was just published uh, in Jack, which was the extension of the original Freedom Trial, and basically following these patients for about 8.5 years, showing still the mortality in favor of cabbage over PCI. These are the diabetic patients. The, clearly, the higher mortality of the PCI, uh, we, we knew at five years, and now at 8.5 years, curves actually slightly separated uh, more than what it was there originally. Uh, and uh, if you take the whole freedom cohort, and particularly younger the patient, better was the benefit. So it seems to be that diabetic patient, multivessel, diabetic, young age, will benefit on long term, 8.5, 10 plus years uh, with the cabbage. Then the syntax trial, which was the data of the five years which were presented before, uh, based on the syntax score, cabbage versus PCI, we knew that uh, Overall, the five-year, uh, the MACI, which is the adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular event, was in favor of cabbage, particularly so patients who have more complex disease. Now we have the 10-year follow-up of those called syntaxes. Syntax uh, extended the survival uh, endpoint, and we showed that 10 year all-cause mortality, again, about 4% statistically just in favor. Uh, not Did not make a p-value significant, but, but again, the curves will start separating, and if you take multi-vessel disease, it all become positive. So multi-vessel patients, high complex uh, three-vessel disease, they did better uh, with the cabbage compared to PCI, left main did not, and uh, if you take uh, here, based on the syntax score, and syntax score is more than 33, 
The, this is the third group that clearly the higher is the syntax score, patient will do better with the cabbage. But again, this was a trial done with the old stent, Cypher and Texas, but this is what the data we have. There was another one, main compare, more of a registry data, showed the similar data, but more important, I want to bring you to the attention, is our Excel trial. Excel trial was the trial of the left main, uh, left main with, a mod, with intermediate syntax score, 32 or below, randomizing them to the current drug looting stent versus cabbage. And uh, this was a trial of 1,800 patient, and basically we knew that at three years, they were identical. As you, this was the data presented about three, two years ago, three year identical. We all learned that after three years in the freedom syntax uh, in Barry, the curve separated only after three years. And you see here, overall endpoints point of view, death and stroke or MI at five years was identical, but problem, same, mortality. Even in these patients with an intermediate syntax score and left main, there was about 3 plus percent mortality benefit of uh, cabbage compared to PCI. So it shows basically that all the overall endpoints were not, signi not significant, but uh, the stroke was against, the stroke was higher in the cabbage group, which we always expected, but of, uh, the revascularization uh, and so was higher with the PCI group. But uh, more importantly is the mortality. That is a concerning, and some, even with the current extent, overall, although the trial, the data looks very positive, but to me, I think we have to be honest, that truly patients with the, uh, the long term, we are looking into it, the even PCI in an intermediate risk left main group did not stand with the, against the cabbage. So then the few other, quickly, the complete trial of STEMI PCI, you know, the, this has been a debate. Culprit versus complete revascularization in STEMI. We had done three trials of PREMI, Culprit, and Primluti, and all those showed that doing a complete revascularization in STEMI patients was superior and having a lower uh, endpoints, uh, lower uh, subsequent endpoints uh, compared to just doing the culprit vessel, and that changed the guideline. It used to be three, became 2B. So recommendation changed in 2013 because of the various trials. So now question was, what are the, these were the small trials. What about the large trial and with a different strategy? And basically was that if you do a complete revascularization, should you do it in hospital or you do it within after discharge? Or, and uh, the large number of patients, this was the complete trial primary objective. Again, 4,000 plus cases. Uh, these are the individual the baseline characteristics and the procedure done, uh, the radial approach and so, not a very complex, but it showed that death NMI, it was 2.7% in the complete revascularization at five years compared to 3.7% in the, the culprit only. So clearly the culprit, it seems to be the complete revascularization in STEMI patient is the answer. And uh, the, if you take a ischemic revascularization, curves are even further different. So these are the individual endpoints. There's no difference in death. Uh, but definitely the MI and ischemic revascularization is better with the complete revascularization, another major trial we showed. Now, second issue was, should you do a PCI in the same hospital admission if you decided for complete revascularization or you should do it after initial hospitalization? It turns out to be that whether you do it same time, same hospitalization or within 21 days. They did it within 21 days, there was no difference. So these are the individual endpoints of so. So it basically puts it together uh, that another evidence that you should do complete revascularization. Now, it's a little different in the culprit shock. The shock trial, when your complete revascularization, a study showed that complete revascularization had a higher event rate compared to only culprit vessel revascularization. So it's a totally different uh, strategy in the STEMI patients compared to culprit shock. And that changed the guidelines that now, the full revascularization in, the, in a cardiogenic shock patient is not indicated. It's like class three. You should do only the culprit vessel PCI. Now, based on the positive data of the complete trial, are we going to change the guideline from 2016, which is, or 13 to 16, which is 2A, to a 1B? And I will, just time will tell, but it seems to be there's enough evidence now that complete revascularization is better. Then, 
the ISA React 5 trial of comparing Prasagul versus Ticagrelor, or you say, what is this all about? Well, we had done the trials comparing to P, uh, P2Y12 to inhibitor. We did Triton Timmy trial comparing clopidogrel and Prasagul, where it showed benefit in the ischemic endpoint, but higher bleeding. Then we did a Plato trial, ty uh, clopidogrel versus Ticagrelor, and it showed that better in terms of ischemic, but higher bleeding rate. So clearly we have the data that these agents were better than clopidogrel. So now what about uh, that led to the guidelines that they are the preferred agent in your STEMI and non-STEMI patients. So what about comparison of the ticagrelor with prasagrel? We have one small study uh, of the STEMI patients, about 1,200, showed the no difference in outcome. But this was still the small study. So then now we have the major trial of 4,000 plus patients in acute coronary syndrome comparing ticagrelor versus prasagrel. This was the ISA REACT 5 trial. So basically, uh, as you can see here, non-STEMI were 46%, STEMI were 41%, unstable angina 12%, 2,000 in each group, ticagrelor versus prasagrel. And what did they find? To a lot of people's surprise, but I can tell you, it has been my practice many times using the prasagrel, which because in last few years, people stopped believing in prasagrel. Now we have this trial, ISA React 5, showing head-to-head -head comparison with ticagrelor that Prasagul was superior in terms of decreasing the MI, as you can see here, compared to primary and compared to ticagrelor, and that basically drove the positive uh, endpoints in favor of Prasagul. Now, what about the bleeding? As you can see, bleeding was no difference. What also, why? Because Prasagul always used to have high bleeding. Well, they used a five milligram dose in many of them. And if you know, uh, our at Mount Sinai policy is, we give five milligram, 10 milligram only to patients where we have put more than three stents or patient more than 100 kilo. Otherwise, everybody gets five milligram in our cath lab. And I think that is what, in my opinion, the lower bleeding led to the better outcome as shown here in this ISAR REACT-5 trial. Very, very provocative trial. Second trial was, what about the old patient? Should you be using ticagrelor versus uh, uh, the, or clopidogrel uh, versus uh, prasagrel? Uh, old patients, clopidogrel versus ticagrelor, and showed again that bleeding higher with ticagrelor in these patients, but no difference in ischemic endpoint. So it makes sense. Another group of patients, old patients don't give these agents, a strong agent which cause more bleeding. Uh, clopidogrel does the, quite a good job. The top advance, in my opinion, the trial of coronary intervention of 2019 is the twilight trial of aspirin discontinuation. Aspirin has become the bad child in some way in this uh, entire year. So until now, we know that ischemic, you need a, the dual antipilated therapy for three to six months. 12 months, you definitely need for ischemic. And we have done the trial to stopping the P2Y12 inhibitors. But turns out to be, what if the aspirin is the culprit? Because maybe it's not the P2Y12, it's the aspirin which is the trouble. That is causing the bleeding. And we know aspirin, a lot of people develop bleeding. So this is the year of, uh, I would say, the last year. You know, many of the primary prevention trials of the aspirin really showed the aspirin was not beneficial or even harmful. Then it went to the intervention. One of the trial, the basically was the global leaders, uh, which showed overall that there was no benefit. There was just a slight benefit of uh, discontinuing aspirin after one month compared to your regular routine therapy. So at least gave idea that one month, there was a lot of compliance issues so that overall, all the trend was there, but did not make a superiority uh, with the one month of aspirin discontinuation. And then we did many of the stent trials where we stop, continue PTY-12, but then stop the aspirin either at three months or one month. So this is the case, the trial where was done a smart choice uh, in Germany, showing that by stopping your aspirin after three months, Con rather than continuing that you have identical mace and uh, lower bleeding. Then there was second trial from Japan, stop DAP2. Another trial, stop aspirin after one month. And showed what? With a clopidogrel, that 60% uh, was clopidogrel, 40% was prasagrel. And again, showing the same, that you have overall net clinical benefit in favor of giving one month of aspirin and stop the aspirin after one month. 
and continue the dual entry of uh, the, the P2Y trial inhibitor. These are the individual endpoints. So it seems to be aspirin became the now, uh, like nobody should take it. So well, so the very nice editorial was the dual antipolated therapy, is it time to cut the cord with aspirin? And answer that time was maybe not that early. Let's wait some uh, one trial which they mentioned and that trial was twilight. And this is what presented by Roxana Maran. Trial was done by concept, our concept at Mount Sinai was run by Mount Sinai ICANN School of Medicine. And uh, the, the whole trial was implemented and published in NEJM last week. The hypothesis was if you stop aspirin after three months, what happened is it was sponsored by AstraZeneca. I suggested to Dr. Maran that make it one month because we knew the, in our practice, we knew one month is good enough. And then, of course, the data came later on. I'm talking about back in 2011, 2012, when the trial was being uh, started uh, by, and formulated. But they did not agree. They made three months. And uh, the plan was, the objective of the trial was that impact of the single antiplatelet therapy of ticagrelor versus DAPT. Ticagrelor plus aspirin for 12 months will have a lower bleeding. And of course, similar in terms of ischemic endpoint. Then we wanted to make sure that we are using it in a complex cases. So it was a high risk patients, and they were defined has to have clinical criteria of old age, female gender, troponin positive MI, and so. And then angiographic criteria that is not a simple straightforward lesion, multi vessel disease, multiple stents, thrombotic lesion, bifurcation lesions, and so. And this was the randomization that three months. All patients got aspirin and uh, ticagrelor. After three months, in a double-blind placebo fashion, uh, aspirin was uh, stopped and uh, was placebo versus aspirin, then followed for 12 months additional, and then three months after that as an observation period. multi 180 sites, 11 countries, total patients uh, started with 9,000. The three months event happened in about 17% of cases. So of the 9,000 became 7119 patients which were randomized to ticagrelor plus aspirin 3564 and ticagrelor alone 3555. And these are the individual, the procedural details and so. And most important is our primary endpoint was the bleeding and expecting the, or predicting the ticagrelor alone compared to aspirin after three months, we'll have a lower bleeding. And guess what happened? Absolutely correct. That was a 3% lower bleeding with ticagrelor alone after three months and continue another 12 months. You say, well, that's okay. But what about aspirin? Maybe it causes thrombosis. Uh, these are the individual endpoints of the bleeding. As you can see, the lower bleeding in all the subgroups. But then the efficacy endpoint, which is the death MI and stroke, which were concerned by dropping the aspirin, what will happen? Well, nothing will happen. Exactly identical. So clearly, she has paved the guideline change that aspirin probably should be given between one to three months once you're using a ticagrelor uh, therapy. Uh, and uh, these are the ischemic endpoints. And so uh, also it actually they showed the benefit in both acute coronary syndrome as well as stable uh, syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome was 65% of the patient population, uh, and so. Uh, so this was, then question was, why that happened? Is it by taking aspirin? Did you decrease the platelet activity? This was a sub-study of the twilight, really looking into the mechanistic region that is this, does the effect of ticagrelor correlate with the platelet activation? It's a Badiman chamber, a lot of thrombogenicity, platelet activation studies were done and basically showed that your ticagrelor plus aspirin or ticagrelor plus placebo had a similar platelet inhibition. So what does that mean? Aspirin did nothing except causing bleeding. Nothing in the ischemic, nothing with the platelet aggregation does cause bleeding. So and these are the, for also different uh, platelet reactivity. So now we have the basis of the outcome of the twilight trial uh, with the understanding this feature. So therefore, ticaglor with or without aspirin, high-risk patient, although high-risk patients who underwent PCI and completed three months of dual uh, antiplatelet therapy, ticaglor monotherapy was associated with a lower incidence of clinically relevant bleeding than ticaglor plus aspirin with no higher risk of death, MI, stroke, or stent 
thrombosis. So this, in my opinion, is the top 10 trial, top trial of the coronary intervention in 2019. So now put it together. So what did we learn today? Change in clinical practice for the trials. We saw radial PCI in STEMI, ticagrelor in diabetic patient. No good. Cabbage, five to 10 years plus. Rotation arthrectomy, calcific lesion, FFR PCI, clopidogrel in 70 years of age, one plus. Multivessel STEMI PCI, cardiogenic shock initiative, no X alone without aspirin, plus plus. The real plus plus is presagulin ACS and aspirin one to three months post PCI with ticagrelor to me a real game changer of 2019 to us become a better interventionist and improve our patient's survival. With that note, you know that our data of the 2016, we have the last, uh, our uh, PCI report, uh, while maintaining the big lead than any other center, double star means the low, statistically lower mortality, 30-day risk-adjusted mortality, and this star we have since the report comes in 1994, and many of our interventionists, myself, Keeney, and others, this year actually was Pedro Moreno, and so I get the double star because having a 30-day risk-adjusted mortality lower, uh, the growth continued. So PCI, when we felt that it was going down, now appropriate cases are coming up and overall complications. If this is the data for last five years, less than 1%. Major complication of death, am I taken all patient together and stroke uh, remain. And of course, the mortality of the PCI is about 0 0.3, uh, 2 to 0.3%. So really has made a big difference. Uh, Dr. Keeney already shared our CCC live cases, which we have both, uh, all three actually, coronary, peripheral interventions, and structural heart. The, the first one, the, the third Tuesday is the one which we had done for 10 plus years, just celebrated. And now the live pages, we have our own CCC live webcast of 764, and then we have you, YouTube. So over 1 million. 1 million hits to our uh, monthly live cases for last 10 years in 130 plus countries, the top being USA, second India. India is a big follower along with many, many other countries because goal is always to disseminate the knowledge, get the best results, get the best strategy, not only procedural, also pharmacology and the subsequent treatment of these patients. The, just to advance this field further, we started for last year, did the first time, the transcatheter, New York transcatheter valve, this year is on December 5th, uh, will be uh, uh, the, in uh, New York uh, and uh, the, in Grand Hyatt, uh, this one day dedicated conference uh, for the structural heart. We'll do about six, seven live cases. I have great faculty just finishing the program, but it uh, will be another resource, educational resource available for all of uh, you. Uh, to be part. With that note, I'll stop here and thank you very much and I'll take any questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's another point. So the other, the dose now comes down to, so of the various agents, clopidogrel, ticagrelor, and rivaroxaban has shown the 2.5 milligram twice a day patient with coronary artery disease or peripheral arterial disease have benefit, but same, has associated higher bleeding. So key is, so people have not shifted to it, so, but that's another agent in a stable patient who have history of CAD, peripheral arterial disease, along with uh, aspirin. I would say the answer would be the day we do another trial with agent alone. If you would have used rivaroxaban 2.5 twice a day without aspirin, I'm sure benefit without having the bleeding, but still there is a bleeding issue. So question will come now that what do you do? You have a, the ticagrelor based on the Pegasus trial that patients with prior MI, so you should continue. Patients we have with rivaroxaban 2.5 twice a day, uh, another agent, and now diabetic who have prior PCI. So should you be using ticagrelor? So I think this is the field evolving to me. The, our concern should be now, not ischemic. Very prob our concern is the bleeding. And because stents are our, the management of the patient, medical management, and the PCI point of view have become so good. So we are not worried about ischemic. We are worried about bleeding. So anything which adds to bleeding is a problem. So now, you think about the first time the trial done, twilight, 
we took something out rather than adding. Every trial added some agent. We said, no, take that out, take the aspirin out. So I think this will be a, maybe a major player. Uh, after some time, maybe just giving a ticagrelor alone without any uh, aspirin. So I think many other trials are being formulated at this time. But, but my message is very simple, that patients who are had finished their duration of, let's say, one year of antiplatelet therapy, so wh which patient you should continue, whether rivaroxaban, ticagrelor, or clopidogrel in some cases, because even Karishma, in the Karishma trial, the patients who have prior CAD was a benefit. So any of these agents, maybe those who are frequent flyer, frequent events, uh, may continue, uh, and you decide one of the agent. But unofficially, I can say, once you decide that, probably it's a prudent, based on the data, although no trial has done yet, that take away the aspirin. The only trial, both uh, the global leaders and Twilight, is the trial of PCI patients. So we took the aspirin out in the PCI. We have not taken the aspirin out in the non-PCI patients yet. So that will be the next field uh, to show continued efficacy of this uh, more potent agent, but uh, without affecting, uh, uh, without increasing the bleeding. Any other question? Yes. So I think uh, till we know some uh, definite trial, but it looks like that our love to aspirin has to go away. This was the gay, this was the agent which everybody felt, uh, even uh, the people with the middle age with a little risk factor, diabetics taking aspirin, the trial showed no benefit, rather create more trouble, bleedings, maybe even uh, some cancers and so. So key is that aspirin is going out now. So what question is what would you do now? based on the data we have at present. So I would say that it's reasonable at present from PCI point of view that you give it for one month only, which is between global leaders and twilight, one to three months, whichever way, but then continue one agent. Now what about if you're giving a clopidogrel and you're taking the aspirin out? Well, with the PCI we learned, with the both a smart choice and stop dapt, that one to three months is also enough. So key is the PCI is, seems to be simple, okay, that you take the aspirin out. Now, question is, when you're using other agents, what would you do? So one thing for sure, that once you're using the NOAX for some kind of secondary prevention, it looks like that alone is good enough. So like Augustus trial, so we, similar, similarly with Rivaroxaban, so those that it's okay to just use alone without aspirin. So key is, for PCI, just give it a very short time. Outside the PCI, probably these agents alone will be good enough. So that will be my message, and that is what uh, we, I would say, I would recommend uh, in our, uh, the, as a protocol and the guidelines to our health system. Yes. Yeah, so the question will come that what about you do more than 12 months and so. So I, I think at, in the twilight, we did three months after when we stopped the uh, ticagrelor and we left whatever people wanted to do. And majority of them, they stopped the ticagrelor, continued only aspirin, there was no rebound effect. So question will come more complex will be that these patients now, uh, while those who need non-cardiac surgery, we always have allowed now except for the spine, or neuro, neurosurgical procedure that continue as, uh, the aspirin and stop the P2Y12. So now question will come, if you are only on P2Y12 inhibitor, only, and no aspirin, so now you are going for gallbladder surgery or hip surgery for five days discontinuation, which is for uh, clopidogrel and uh, seven for, uh, and, you know, ticagrelor and seven days for presagrel, what will happen? So that is, again, some issues, 
uh, that uh, what should, should those patients go back on aspirin uh, for their non-cardiac surgery? We know that for neurosurgery, no, but non-cardiac surgery. So I would say I don't have a clear-cut answer for that, but I would say that if you've gone beyond one year, probably brief interruption will be okay because that we learned from the peristral. So brief interruption, particularly once you've gone beyond a certain time, 90 days, uh, 180 days and so, brief interruption doesn't give trouble. Uh, and uh, knowing that patient didn't have any event in between that time, before. So that brief interruption of five, seven days will not be a trouble. But yes, this will be a, this is the question which probably some uh, further studies or publications will answer that question. That maybe should that patient get some antiplatelet protection uh, because you now, the patients were on ticagrelor, patients were on rivaroxaban or uh, epixaban. So what do you do in those cases? Should you change for that time period on aspirin? Uh, we don't have the answer, but that, yes, that will be a problem, but hopefully will be the good problem because other patients will do very well without having aspirin and less bleeding. So, we, yeah, basically, we actually adopted the policy. Uh, we did a small trial with the platelet activation uh, and reactivity at our center. And what we found that uh, in, on top of aspirin, everybody got baby aspirin, that uh, giving 10 milligram was too much. It was inhibiting platelets 90%, 98%, and which we call PRU, platelet reactive unit, was like 40, 50, which should be about 200. So, therefore, we did the study to see what is the... The, whether 5 milligram is good enough. And we found that 5 milligram of Presigol was good enough, but loading dose the same. Is a 60 milligram, you load patients who are naive, and you give 30 milligram loading dose, patients who are already taking clopidogrel. So with that load, you're taking a 5 milligram, where we found that trouble was if you're 100 kilo and above, or you put multiple stents, because those are the, not even diabetics, those were the state more platelet aggregation or maybe higher dose was required. So that we made the policy almost five years ago that anybody at uh, Sinai, and I know that many of our referring physicians question that policy, and so, but we, I can tell you, we follow our patients and we have never been in trouble uh, because it's the higher dose which caused the bleeding, and therefore low dose of five milligram is very efficacious and it's good enough. So rare patient, uh, or not rare actually, 100 kilo is not rare nowadays in America, but uh, 100 kilo and above and uh, more than three stents, that patient should be, need a 10 milligram. But, or if you know the known resistance. Now, if many times we do the platelet reactiv reactivity test. We used to do it very commonly, but the studies showed that incorporating platelet reactivity in your PCI doesn't matter because those did not change by increasing the dose or so. So if we have ever done, we do now maybe one or two patients every other day, if we found the platelet, the unresponsiveness of to clopidogrel, in that case, and I have to use the presigrel, there I will use the same 10 milligram dose. But otherwise, 5 milligram in all, except 100 kilo and more than three stents.